Okay, this is a clarification of what I just posted on Hebrews 11, 1 Revisited in, I forget which part of uh, the Hebrews 11, 1 Revisited, I said uh, 1 Timothy 2.15, it's not 1 Timothy 2.15, it's 1 Timothy 2.5, Aiskar Teos, Aiskar Mesites, okay? Um, I just wanted to clarify that, and then the other thing is that I think I finally figured out which way the writer of Hebrews meant us to interpret the subjective and objective genitive. So I'm going to go through that, and this is this is um, as you saw, there's a lot of fluidity there when we went through the. Um, third clause, but I think there's a way that you can divide out which it is that the writer is stressing. And, you know, see what you think and what I say next, and, you know, if you come up with something better or something different, let me know. Okay. Do you need to see this again? Yeah, you do. Let's just cover up the translation altogether, because the translation altogether, well, no, I'll leave this there. Hopefully you've seen by now that this is absolutely the opposite of what the verse is trying to tell you. All right? So let's talk about that. Estinda, it's about. Then follow three predicate clauses, each of seven syllables on purpose. It's evocative of temple building because that's the whole theme of the chapter. The whole book is about how Israel can't get restored until church is raptured. That's what the whole book is about. The new covenant is getting an insertion of church. And he's trying to explain why that happens and how it bridges time back to Israel. And by Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, he gets to his climactic thing of better things for church. And when that's done, then the Old Testament people, who are the topic of Hebrews 11, will be resurrected. But they won't be resurrected apart from us. So in other words, the sequence is church, then back to Israel, then you got the millennium and the resurrection of the OT people. You know, church, trib, OT people, resurrection. Because that was the original schedule pre-church. Okay, so as he begins this chapter, he say it's about because it, this is, the da is a transitional particle here. Okay, so in English there's really almost no need to translate it at all. You just say it's about, and then begins our first predicate clause. Pisti ser piso meno. Now the question here is which genitive. Because you got to pick one, and I said, well, you could cycle through them. Yeah, you can. But I think the writer of Hebrews is, is telling us how to do this. Which one of these do you call it? So now i got to get a little more technical. If this is acting on this, then in the Greek grammar people would call it a subjective genitive. Subjective meaning that the subject is epizomeno in the genitive is how you, you you go by what the genitive is doing. Epizomeno the confident believings would be acting on pistis the word. Okay? If this is subjective genitive. Okay, but that doesn't make any sense. We don't act on the word, the word acts on us. That's stated in a thousand places of the Bible. So your first big clue that you want to interpret this genitive as objective genitive is that everywhere, especially in this epistle in Hebrews 4.12, the word acts on us, that's why we believe it. When you're believing anything, there's a content. It's due to the content that you believe. 
The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any Makaira. That's Hebrews 4.12. He's already covered that point by the time he gets here. So we should read this as objective, which is what I had said. But I didn't make it clear, and I was waffling. Okay? The word is in the nominative case. That's your second big hint. It's in the nominative case. And it's the content of what you believe. It's also the cause of what you believe. In other words, if there were no Bible, how would you have today, 2,000 years after Christ, how would you have any ability to have any information on which to believe if there were no Bible? You wouldn't. So it's the Word of God acting on us which causes the confident believings, plural, genitive, plural. So this should be an objective genitive. And that means that the subject is pistis. Now here's the second reason why we can say that. Because in our second predicate clause, opostasis pragmaton, just ignore this comma, some scribe put that there. That's not in the original text. Opostasis pragmaton is our second clause. Okay, if this is really the subject acting on the believers, duh, then by apposition, this, meaning Christ, is acting on the trials. So the trials are the object. This is really important. I almost missed it. The trials, this is also an objective genitive, the trials are the object. It's really important. The trials are the object of Christ. He is the subject of the trials. We all know that. Okay? We are the ones that are actually on trial. We all know that. We are partakers of him. Hebrews 3.14. Because that's very much being referenced here. So you could call us the object of the trials for that reason too, okay? But to say that the trials are the object of the hypostasis, the reality of Christ, the assurance, capitalized reality, capitalized assurance as nicknames for Christ. And it means Christ, the beingness. It's also a play on the sacred tetragrammaton, all right? The Christ, the reality, the assurance, the substance, the nature of God as the subject. It's in the nominative case, just like Pistis is in the nominative case. All right? To say he's the subject and that the trials are the object of Christ implies that the trials are on purpose by God's design. And any Calvinist will tell you, you bet, and they'd be right. In other words, God has a plan. Yeah, we're on trial. We're the object of the trial. Christ is the subject of the trial. Christ is the subject of everything. All our promises find their yes in him. Hebrews 1 began with, he's the beginning, the ending, and all the middle too. The exact nature of God. So wouldn't it stand to reason that he's the subject causing the action of the genitive and he really is by any standard you want to name he's also the object of the trial in the sense of the goal of the trial the purpose of the trial you see all this wordplay so this too is objective genitive you with me on this? But what tipped me off to it the most is right here. Elegos u blepomeno. Okay? Seeings don't cause evidence. This, this to me is what clinches the argument that these are all objective genitives. Okay? If it were subjective genitive here, 
the implication would be that the seeing is acting on the evidence. Well, that, that fails the logic test right away. Seeing is a result of evidence. See, if there's no evidence, you can't see it. It's the evidence that's in the nominative case. The evidence is the actor, and this not seeing is the object. You see, this has to be objective genitive. It, it wouldn't even make sense if you called it subjective genitive. So I think that if you have to pick which of the three it is, although I think you've got enough double entendre here to play it all three ways, subjective, objective, and plenary, the writer is talking about objective genitive. So pistis is the actor on the believers who are confidently believing. Hypostasis Christ is the actor on the trials, and then this is where the object in the trials. He's still on trial, but he's the subject of the trial. He's the cause of the trial. God would have a purpose for that trial. God would want the trial. You see what I'm saying? This is asserting sovereignty right here. That's in apposition to word of God. Christ, the word in the flesh, is the word of God in writing. Okay? Therefore, sovereign. Therefore, the reason for causing, wanting, having a plan for, and therefore, this is objective genitive also. Finally, and most conclusively, evidence. Evidence is a cause. Evidence is not a result. It's a cause. Seeing or not seeing doesn't cause anything. Seeing is a, is a passive thing. Something's in front of your face and you see it. Something's not in front of your face and you don't. Your seeing or not seeing is a result of some other action happening in front of you or behind you. It has to be in front of you for you to see it. Okay? It has to be in front of your eyes for you to see it. That can't be too hard to understand. So this has to be objective genitive. Now, disagree if you want, because you know, like everything else, there's always there's always more to say about a Bible verse. But I'm voting with objective genitive, because faith, the Bible, is acting on us, and that's why we believe. Otherwise, there'd be no way you could believe, because you'd have no content to believe in. Hypostasis, Christ, is the subject, the cause, you know, the be-all, end-all, alpha and omega of what? The trials, and it's the trials that we're in as objects. Because that's the whole theme of the chapter. And finally, and most conclusively, evidence is a cause, not an effect. Seeing is an effect, not a cause. Can't see what's not there. And if you see it, you're receiving something. So, you know, yell at me if you want. And hopefully I'm done now. Peace out.